Okay, access to data from regulatory authorities. I have borrowed some slides from, oh, now here it is again, Bill Gates making trades. So, <laughs> he went away. So, uh, I have borrowed some slides from my PhD student, uh, Anna Jorgensen, and um, what we did was that we applied to the European Medicines Agency five years ago a very simple request, namely trial protocols and trial reports of two anti-obesity drugs. We wanted to explore the robustness of the results, study selective reporting, and this was because the effect is quite small of anti-obesity drugs, and there are significant and substantial harms, and many of these drugs have been taken off the market because of these harms. But it was very difficult to get access to these data, although uh, the regulation that is important here in the European Union specifies that any citizen of the Union and any natural or legal person and so on has a right of access to document of the institutions. Okay, that sounds good, but it didn't work that way. Um, also, it says that uh, openness contributes to strengthening the principles of democracy in the European Union and also the legitimacy of its decisions. Now, we received a reply from the EMAS director, Thomas Lundgren, who said, we regret to inform you that the documents you requested cannot be released because there are some exceptions to these wonderful rules. And uh, the exception applies to the documents we requested and why? Commercial interests. Okay. Now, we spent the next three and a half years before we got access to the data and we published all this in the British Medical Journal. So the delays on our part uh, amounted to 11% of the first three years, and we awaited replies for 1,028 days, and they always came in at the last moment according to the deadline that the European Ombudsman had imposed on the EMAS director, Thomas Lundgren. So that was a pretty funny experience. Now, what were the main arguments? The European Medicines Agency was very worried about uh, undermining protection of commercial interests, and competitors could use the documents for similar products, they said. We said that uh, these study reports and protocols are based on well-known principles. There are no commercially sensitive information whatsoever in these documents. Furthermore, uh, trials represent the last phase of a drug development program. So how could competitors use these documents for similar products that they were first going to invent and then study in rats and humans and so on? It's pretty far out, we thought. Now, since the EMA wouldn't talk to us really, we complained to the European Ombudsman. And uh, he said that he could not see that access would specifically and actually undermine commercial interests because that's part of EU regulations. You cannot just say there is a risk. You should be more specific than that. So this was an important point. And I must say the European Ombudsman is a fantastic person. He really saw our case as something of general interest. Now, um, what about the overriding public interest? Because you can get access, even though they are commercial interests, if you can say that it is an overriding public interest. So this was our other argument. Now, the EMA said, it's us who evaluates and monitors safety and efficacy of drugs. So no need for you guys in Cochrane to get access to anything. There is no overriding public interest which they said, so we said that, come on, post-marketing surveillance could never have re revealed that Vioxx 
kills people through heart attacks, as Teddy showed us, because many people die of heart attacks. So when this rate is raised, you wouldn't discover that. That's very likely. So this monitoring of safety is not very safe. Now, we also said that we had already noticed that there were different numbers in different reports from the EMA and from the FDA and from the published articles. So there surely was a need for some detective work here. And furthermore, and most importantly, we had a lot of evidence that select selective outcome reporting can kill thousands of patients. So come on now, how can you say there isn't an overriding public interest when patients die by the tens of thousands because of all this commercial interest? So what did the ombudsman say? He say, I, I don't take a definitive stance on whether there is an overriding public interest because he already said that he didn't believe in the, in the commercially sensitive information. So he never ruled on this particular issue. Now there were some other interesting arguments. Um, the EMA said it was an administrative burden to redact personal data that we are not allowed to see. And the documents would actually be worthless for us after they are having handled them. Um, it's almost like the drug industry. That, I mean, that's how they argue. Now, what we said was, that's funny because we didn't have similar problems when we got access to a third anti-obesity drug at the Danish Medicines Agency. That worked well. Furthermore, uh, the ombudsman again helped us and said the only personal data is study authors and principal investigators, the name of those, which is pretty funny. But for example, in Germany, they are very anxious about revealing names of people. Whereas I think if people participate in a trial, they're accountable. Why can't we know their names? That's a bit funny, but, but that's how it is. So we would only need to redact some names, and that would be quick and easy. So after uh, the EMAS didn't, uh, still didn't give way, and Thomas Lundgren, its director, went out in a lucrative consulting business for the drug industry after he had opposed us for three years, so there was somewhere in the European Parliament about conflicts of interest at the European Medicines Agency. Now, uh, after, uh, after he didn't get anywhere, this ombudsman who worked with our case for years, he published a press release where he said, EMA's refusal to grant access is maladministration. And the EMA just couldn't, ex couldn't uh, then deny any longer. So... Um, they gave in. And uh, what are the implications of this? The EMA has now recently widened the access to trial protocols and clinical study reports, and other regulatory agencies should follow suit. We are now ahead of the FDA after many years of having been behind the FDA uh, in revealing secrets. And the Cochrane collaboration supports free access to all data from all clinical trials, including the raw data, the individual patient data. And I have now many valuable contacts in the European Parliament because of this. And I worked on, work on trying to create legislation there to make data sharing happen uh, through the contacts I have as guidelines and other voluntary agreements uh, don't work. And there should be appropriate sanctions that hurt to hold those accountable who will still refuse to share their data. I have written a long report about this, which a European politician asked me to do that I published um, last year. You can see below here. Now, we, we then do some further research at our center. Now we look at the uh, antidepressant drugs uh, on suicidality, hostility, and violence caused by antidepressant drugs. And many of you will know that the large companies have cheated with their data uh, when reporting on suicidality in children and adolescents. They have called suicidality emotional lability. They have called them admission to hospital or lack of effect. I consider this outright fraud. Uh, so now we are studying whether these drugs are also dangerous in adults by getting access to individual patient data at the EMA.
We know they are dangerous in children. They might also be dangerous in adults. We don't know yet. And we also study observer variation when people code harms. To our big surprise, there isn't a single observer variation study in the universe where people have studied what happens when a patient reports an adverse event. You have coding instruments. There must be huge variation in that. And also cheating, as you can see. So we need to study that. So we are embarking on this. Now, what, are the what is the experience from other drug regulators? Uh, the UK is like contacting MI5. It's completely closed, and it's anonymous. I even can't get a name who sent me an email. Oh, it's very weird. Uh, and their excuse was workload. Even when we restricted our request to virtually nothing, it was still workload. They couldn't do it. But then it helped when I reminded them that actually the UK, though they, they might not believe it, belongs to the European Union. So they t should take care of uh, our case with the EMA and the European Ombudsman. That helped, and then we got some documents. The Netherlands were more positive, but prolonged negotiations involving companies that, of course, routinely denied us access, and the case is still not settled. And not f unfortunately, adverse events will be redacted. So these documents will be worthless for us. And why is it that we can't be allowed to see that drugs harm patients. This is utterly unacceptable. But the regulators are very positive, but they are under restriction of their local law. Now, in Denmark, we are also positive, but it took two years. The company protested, and all the narratives on adverse effects on a, an anti-obesity drug were redacted. So the data were useless for us. In Sweden, they are hugely positive. We can get access to everything, but unfortunately, the data are on paper. They take up 70 meters. You won't believe it, but it, it does. In a mountain cave, and it's very costly to retrieve it. So we have some kind of standoff there with our nice Swedish friends. Uh, so there are practi practical issues here. Now, the international calls for data sharing have come from a lot of good organizations, but they are always restricted to publicly funded research. And what I have debated in my paper, there is no difference between public, report, public research and industry-funded research. It's an artificial distinction. Also, the British House of Commons have uh, said that society's obligations towards the patients who participate in trials and all other patients must take precedence over commercial interests. The public is always a partner, contributing trial participants, infrastructure, taxpayers contribute both to research and by paying for the drugs once they're on the market. And there is actually quite some understanding in the European Union that you cannot distinguish between industry trials and publicly funded trials. But there is a long way to go because there is immense lobbying in Brussels from the drug industry. Now, who owns the trial data? Respect for trial participants, they, off, they run a personal and unknown risk by participating in trials, so therefore they must be the owner of trial data and also the society. I have been told by a lawyer that you cannot own, own data, which is interesting, so we'll work with that. And research can only be a public good if the public can see the data. And it's, it's, of course, an unacceptable double standard that trial participants, they share data about themselves with investigators and drug companies. And then these investigators and drug companies are unwilling to share those data with other people. It's, it, in an ethical perspective, it just doesn't hold. <coughs> So by sharing our research data, we could save billions of any currency every year. At the same time, improve the health and long longevity of the citizens because they would take less drugs when we find out how harmful they are. So the incentive for bias, cheating, and fraud would be reduced when we can check the raw data. And if we don't have an, a complete knowledge base, we would do a lot of redundant research and we can't have informed consent when pa patients participate in trials, obviously, if we don't have all the data. So the ethical review committees, they are sleeping. 
They just w should wake up. I have tried and I have failed. I don't know what they're doing. The benefits of data sharing are obvious. We must get access to everything and a lot of research could be done at almost no cost when we have access to such data. It will lead to tremendous benefits for patients, that's obvious, and we could trust the evidence to a much greater degree than today. And we should ensure that people don't embark on new research unless it's absolutely necessary and they can't obtain their answers by looking at those papers that have been hidden from public view so far. There are also harms of data sharing. Anyone with an agenda could selectively interpret the data. For example, a competing drug company. But consider the alternative societies that have only ver one official version of the truth. Reminds us of the Soviet Union and North Korea and China. And they are not societies we, we would like to live in. Equally important, it's difficult to imagine a worse situation than, than what we have now where people with vested interests so often distort the evidence and we have no chance of checking that they did any wrongdoing. Um, and what does it mean, this mean for the drug industry? It would not be anti-competitive to share our data. They would only compete at a higher ethical level and they would be affected equally. And uh, there could also be benefits, actually, because when drug companies don't know that another company has failed with a drug, they might develop similar drugs that they would never have started developing if they had known about this. Of course, drug use would decrease, so they would lose money, as it would be more difficult to hype drugs when we have access to the data, but this would only lead to more healthy citizens, even those citizens who work in drug companies. Uh, any restrictions on getting access to the data? No, there shouldn't be any restrictions. The European Commission has recommended that data sharing should mean that the data can be used for whatever purpose other researchers might find relevant without needing to obtain permission from those who assembled the data. Any restrictions will lead to arbitrariness and delays and will not be in the best interest of the patients or our societies. Any practical difficulties? Yes, there are all sorts of practical difficulties. But morally, we just cannot go on the way we have done in the past. And when there is a will, there is a way. That's simple. So commercial success of the drug industry is dependent on withholding data from public view. But if we accept this, then there is something fundamentally wrong with the way we prioritize in healthcare. Now, the last slide, drug regulators have actually changed their views. Clinical trial data are not commercial confidential information, they say. Uh, and they, that was regulators from the EMA, even the UK now, has become more positive. France and the Netherlands. They published a paper uh, just a week ago where they said this. They also said in an, in an open society, trial sponsors and regulators do not have a monopoly on analyzing and assessing drug trial results. This is brand new. A year ago, they wouldn't have said that anywhere. Uh, there are some caveats that they came up with in their paper. Patient confidentiality. We must ensure that there, there could be other conflicts of interest than commercial ones, career motives, biased analysis, and they are worried about, for example, these movements against vaccines that are very healthy for our children. People might distort the data. Yes, that's the risk of an open society. And it might lead to urgent calls for regulatory action if people manipulate the data and create dangers that don't exist. So, of course, they're worried about this. And they then suggest that data sharing should only be allowed after receipt of a, of a full analysis plan. Is this a good idea? Well, in principle, it's a, it's a nice idea, but then that will lead to arbitrariness. Who should approve that the plan is good enough? Maybe it's not good enough if it threatens a drug agency's previous decisions. You can see there can be all sorts of problems. So although I think it's a good idea, I support the European Commission that access should be free with no strings attached. 
And then we can recommend that, of course, there should be a full analysis plan. And if people publish something where they have not registered a full analysis plan, then we can say, oh, come on, do we need to take this seriously? You didn't have a protocol for what you did? So we can solve the problem. Then they also say, will regulatory inspection be allowed when academics like Teddy and me do things like that? Well, I don't know, but that can be discussed. But isn't it wonderful? It's rarely, it's very rare I can give a talk and say, yes, something has really changed for the better. Thank you.